Welcome to Behavior Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. I'm Tim Houlihan. I just wanted to start with an announcement. Is that okay, Kurt? Yeah, that's okay. I just want to say that Behavior Grooves was voted the number one behavioral science podcast by Weekly Habits. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it's 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 pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a big deal in our world because we beat out some of our favorite podcasts, which makes us kind of sad, but also really kind of happy. And and those podcasts were hosted by some of our favorite researchers and just practitioners around there. So great field to to be in competition with, and you know, it's just an honor to have won. Yeah, so thank you actually to all of the listeners that voted for us because this was a voting thing. People actually turned out and voted. And that's kind of what makes it really cool. Like somebody just didn't pick it, you know. So this was this was lots of people. So it felt it and feels so, really good. So probably many of you. So thank you. So if you voted for that big heartfelt gratitude coming from both Tim and myself. Thank you. And before we get to our guest, we do have to tell you about a virtual conference that's coming up on January 2021 that Kurt and I are putting on. It's called Nudge It North. And Nudge It North will bring behavioral science insights to people working in behavioral health, UX, CX, marketing, HR, basically in any business that you could think of, you'll get some insights or even just for your own life. It's just kind of like this podcast. (laughs) <laughs> but but better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, because we have not, us. We're just small parts of it. That's why it's better. It again, Nudge It North is going to be a one day conference, and we know that you'll want to attend because it's going to have speakers that are just going to be fantastic. It is going to be great. And so you'll want to get signed up right away at www.nudgeitnorth.com. Our keynote speakers include. Annie Duke, who is one of our favorite guests with books, including Thinking in Bets and our latest How to Decide. And if you want to learn how to make better decisions, well, you won't want to miss her her, her session. Absolutely. Our second monster keynote speaker is Professor Gary Latham, and he's at the Rotman School at the University of Toronto. Gary is the co-creator of goal setting theory. Oh, my gosh. And if that wasn't enough, he's also a master researcher into unconscious motivation and priming. Oh, yeah. It got me thinking about socks once again, every time you bring that up, right? Um, And the headliner for Nudge It North is Bob Cialdini, whose work on influence revolutionized our thinking on how persuasion works. Bob wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Influence, that has sold more than 30 million copies worldwide. And he will be sharing his thoughts in a very informal fireside chat format that will make you feel like he's in the living room with you. That is, if you're listening and watching this virtual conference on your computer in your living room. You know, if if you're in your office, then he's in your office with you. (laughs) Well, all right. So uh, we can't rely just on our keynotes. And we've got some fantastic uh, breakout speakers as well. And as of today, we've got researchers from uh, who are doing a lot of work on incentives. We've also got the past head of UX from PayPal and Target. We've got the VP of behavioral science from Mad Pow. The lineup is truly amazing and it's growing every single day. Let's get back to our guest for this episode. Ryan McShane is the CEO of HR Evolution. His feet are firmly planted in the corporate world as a trainer and human resource consultant, but his work is deeply informed by behavioral science. And that's why we wanted to talk to him. Ryan's background mixes teaching, both in university settings and in corporate settings, with strategic consulting in corporate boardrooms. He's well-versed in behavioral science literature and applies it in his work to help senior leaders develop their corporate culture in ways that improve productivity and job satisfaction with their employees. Our conversation with Ryan included topics such as the employer-employee contract and how that's changed in recent years, the way different generations are dealing with the pandemic, and how leaders can change their mindsets to lead more productive and happier employees. We think you're going to enjoy this one, so we encourage you to sit back with a frothy draft of employee-employer contract brew and listen to our conversation with Ryan McShane. Welcome, Ryan McShane, to Behavioral Grooves. It's so good to be here with you guys. Thank you for having me. We are we are definitely glad to hear you. We're going to get started with the speed round, and so I get to ask the first question, coffee or tea? Coffee. Mm. 
That was hey, quick. Nice and nice. And black, nice black, and cold and bitter, my friends. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. All right. So would you rather have dinner with your favorite business leader or with your favorite musician? Ooh, musician, definitely. Okay, you you have just won Tim over, mm. so you are <laughs> you are I'm, you are going I'm doing so good. Easy. There. <laughs> I'm so easy. If you had a superpower for an hour, what would it be? Ooh, flight. Flight. Mm. Okay. All right. All right. Last one here. Millennials are they the same or different from other generations? I think every generation is different from the other generations. Um, okay. So I would definitely lump millennials in that as well. Um, they're not as disparately different as baby boomers would tell you they are. Uh, <laughs> so we'll talk about that later. <laughs> we'll go into that because you've done you've done a lot of work. A lot of your work is around generational differences in the workplace. And so, mm -hmm. what what are you seeing? And what are you when you're working with organizations? What are the big issues that come up from a generational perspective? Great question. So uh, just this week, I was doing a generational training for a company. And um, it, it's one of my favorite trainings to do because of the experience, stressors, and pain associated with managing multi-generational workforce. And I think all too often, uh, we have a lot of talking at each other instead of with each other. And so that lack of connectivity is what I often hear expressed from my clients. Uh, and I think that it's, it's part of the course that we have different value sets across each one of the generations based on the external conditioning that they were exposed to. Um, so, you know, you see with the veterans and senior generation, um, you know, they're very formal in their approach to uh, life and everything around them, business especially. The baby boomers, uh, it was all about uh, titles and prestige and um, how hard did I work last week, you know, beating our chest. You know, I did 80 hours type of thing, you know, and then you've got the Gen Xers that are stereotypically referred to as the slackers because they saw what eight work and 80 hours did to mom and dad, you know, they became a little jaded as a result of uh, seeing the downsizing, right sizing and all kinds of sizing that their uh, parents were exposed to. And then you've got the millennials and I often refer to them as the digital natives. Uh, they just practically shot out of the womb and had te technology in their hand. And as a result of that, uh, they ob that obviously uh, shaped how they view the world around them. Um, so the boomers, um, which have adopted a lot of the traditional mindset about how we should do work, um, that contrasts greatly to the digital natives who know that, hey, I can do this at three o'clock in the morning and five times faster than you ever expected. Uh, so what is this nonsense about driving an hour into work every morning at 6 a.m.? You've talked about... Um this uh, we, we we're spending a lot more time talking at each other than with each other yeah. and what do you think is the cause of that uh, there's a number of things i think uh, personal agendas um, really guide that and drive that to a great extent i often um, say you know isn't that your experience um, all too often in organizations where you sit down with five other people and you've got six agendas and people are just all talking at each other instead of with each other and I think, um, you know, we've lost some of the tenets of effective communication. And uh, I one of, the, one of my favorite trainings is a dialogue methodology training. And it's predicated on four practices, listening, respecting, suspending, and voicing. And so we listen as if all the information is within us and we're holding space there. And that's the respecting component as well, is we're not planning our grocery list for that evening when someone's talking, we're actually listening for the purpose of understanding. And then that suspending, I think is, is what we most often miss in communication. Our brains love to take little bits of information and quickly classify it. And so we wanna classify it to make sense of the world around us. To do otherwise would, be subject to chaos, continuous chaos. So our brain wants to grab it, make sense of it real quick. We develop meaning around it, and then we run in that direction, whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent. And so that suspension of judgment 
allows new information to continuously come in and flow over us. And at that point, we have an accumulation of much more information than we ever did before. And so, you know, I often refer to the elephant story <clears throat> where, uh, you know, three bl blind men walk up to an elephant and uh, one touches its trunk and says, oh, this must be a snake. You know, one touches, uh, you know, its, uh, its leg and says, oh, this must be a tree. And the other one touches its tail and it's all bristly and says, oh, this must be a donkey. Each of them so firm in their belief based on their limited understanding or liter limited exposure to information um, that they're, they're convinced that they're right when all they need to do is step back and accumulate new information and more information and see very clearly that's an elephant right in front of them. And I think that's an analogy for what we all too often do in organizations. You know, you compound that with the time pressures associated with organizational management and it's, you know, come on, come on, it's all about action. And I think that uh, that action orientation limits our opportunities for reflection as well as accumulation of new information. So when we suspend judgment, as long as we possibly can, we continue to allow new information into us. And science shows us that once we've decided, uh, you know, this is what it is, so to speak, we need overwhelming information to the contrary in order to change our minds. And so how often do we even get that overwhelming contradictory information? Or are we even open to that overwhelming contradictory information? No, no, this is what it is. Uh, don't tell me anything different. And then after the uh, suspension of uh, judgment and we've allowed all this new information to come in, then we need to start voicing. And that voicing comes from not the place of, well, that person just said that, so I'm going to build on what they say. We're articulating based on what's coming up for us. And this is a whole body knowledge understanding. It's not just reflection of what I heard necessarily. But now that I've listened and, and respected and held um, you know, uh, space for you to share what you want to share, now I'm, I'm taking all that information in from a uh, larger perspective. And now I'm going to voice based on that larger perspective as well. So, Ryan, when you, you talk about suspending, right, and, and suspending that judgment, and you bring in this fact that, you know, our brains tend to go to an immediate uh, conclusion or, or draw some element of it. It's a system one thinking, right? We automatically do those kinds of things. Are there, are there ways that you work with your clients to help them suspend that judgment right away? Are, are there tricks to the trade, in other words, that we can take in and use? Because I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to be in the moment and yet, you know, stand back from it, from that perspective? Yeah, what a great question. I, I think it comes down to level of conf consciousness in the moment. And so what I try to do is break it down and make sure that we're analyzing, for example, in a change management scenario, what, what phases, psychologically speaking, what phases do we go through in any kind of change? And so when we put it up on the screen, so to, um, so to speak, or put it on the table and start pulling it apart, let's look at the phases of change as they exist and understand while most people think of change as something new coming in, change is typically tipped off by a loss of something. And so let's make sure that we're paying homage to what is it that we're actually losing. And in so doing, now we've set up a space in order to move into what we hope to gain as a result of this particular change. So I think that can be really powerful, um, just breaking things down and making them more conscious. And I think all too often, you know, they say that we live 95% of our waking life is unconscious. And that's really astounding to me. I, I don't know if those numbers cohere to what your research t tells you, but I mean, I, I think that that's remarkable to think that um, we're, we're just walking around, but half asleep. Um, and so anything that we can do to elevate that level of consciousness to wake from that uh, you know, walking sleep, I think is going to position us better to operate from our consciousness rather than our unconsciousness where much of the fear is hidden. The anxieties are hidden um, and things that we never really questioned before. Is this tantamount to saying uh, you need to have the right mindset? Oh, no question about it. 
No question about it. And um, emotional intelligence is one of my favorite trainings as well. And we were talking about the paradigms of behavior associated with emotional intelligence just yesterday. And so there, the four paradigms are fear, duty, achievement, and integrity. And if we're operating from fear, um, that really creates that self-protectionism. And it's all about s- security. <clears throat> so we view the world uh, and most things around us from a threat standpoint. So I'm going to protect myself from all these things. And if we're viewing the world around us from a threat standpoint, we're really operating from our lowest common uh, denominator, if you will. And that doesn't right. allow for creativity. That doesn't allow for collaboration and exchange and new ideas really coming into us. Because once again, everything external to us is viewed as a threat. Yeah. To what and. and uh to what degree do you see these problems within the within your clients? I, you know, I mean, we're we're talking about them as if they're sort of universals. Are these relatively modest things that that you see occurring? Or are they kind of big things? You know, I come from the standpoint, Tim, that uh, leadership has the greatest influence over culture within an organization, and so to that point, the extent to which the leader is conscious um, or unconscious in terms of their own behaviors and actions, that ripples out and affects the entire culture of the organization. Um, We can look to leadership to really define the culture because it's typically the ethos or mores of the leaders at the helm that dictate what the culture of the organization will look like. Um, So I think it really comes down to not industry, uh, not profession necessarily, but the level of consciousness of the leader at the helm. So one of the things that you, we, we, you know, Tim started this off with is, is this mindset. So how do you get leaders of those organizations? Obviously, if those are the ones that are driving this mm-hmm. downward, how do you get them to change their mindset? I mean, I think, again, to the point of our mindsets, are, you know, they're pretty integral to who we are. So how do you get them to look at things from a different perspective? Um, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it experientially. Um, you know, get them to reflect back on different experiences in their life um, where they might have had uh, the kind of mindset that enabled them to get over a specific challenge. Um, you know, that, that again, implants in their mind, well, I've done this before. It's just a matter of reaching back and finding that space and place within me. Um, and as I said before, as much as you can elevate your, your consciousness to break down uh, and understand where we are, what we need to do uh, in order to move forward. But in addition to that, if we're not addressing what I call with them, what's in it for me? If we're not addressing what's in it for me, there's typically not the impetus to create change. And, you know, I also subscribe to the philosophy and I think it, I found it to be true in my experiences. Most people don't change unless the pain of staying the same exceeds that of doing something differently. And so what I will do is narrow in on um, what exactly we're facing. What are the consequences of not doing anything differently right now? And what are the benefits of going in another direction? And can we map that out in a hypothetical standpoint and then start creating some visioning around what we truly desire instead of what we fear? Um, if people are going to change because there's too much pain to keep going the way that they're going and uh, you've been called in and some people don't have that much pain, mm-hmm. right? That there's not enough. Is there anything that you can do to create the perception or to to change the mindset to go, actually, there is something I do need to change this. I wasn't aware of how difficult this was. Does that question make sense? I, I think so. And, and it really comes down to scenario planning. Um, You know, if you map out where you are right now and the two courses or, uh, you know, the binary choice that you might be facing, if that even is a a binary at that point, um, we can map out. Well, you know, hypothetically speaking, if we go in this direction, these are the uh, stages and phases that we're going to go through. These are the encounters that we're going to have and do that for each one of the scenarios. I think someone can quickly and very consciously see, while I didn't contemplate that before, now I can see that right out in front of me in writing, black and white, and I can see that 
I, that's not the consequence I want to experience. This is more in alignment with the consequence that I do want to experience. So how do we get there? And so you could use like an, an anticipated regret. Basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a doing a pre-mortem a looking out and saying, all right, so what are we, all right, if this fails, it. right? What are the actions that we took in order that, that drove us to this failure and, and, and really looking at it from uh, that, that future perspective, but from that negative outcome potentially within there. So I think there's a lot of really interesting pieces of there. So when you do that, you know, obviously behavior change is one of these, these very difficult things. If, if it wasn't, you know, everybody would be perfectly fit and we'd all eat very healthy and, you know, donut, <laughs> donut manufacturers rough. would go out of business. Um, right. You know, but the, the idea of maintaining this. So I can see the idea of getting this change and getting particularly leadership, you know, excited about this and thinking, oh, we need to do something different. But then, you know, the next week starts and all of a sudden you are, you know, going back into your day in and day out, out work and status quo bias kicks in and we get stuck in our ruts. We get stuck in that kind of uh, component where we, we, we're doing the same things over and over again. So how do you get people out of that and how do you keep that change momentum going and sustained? Great questions. Wow. Um, so I think milestones are important. I almost look at it from a project management standpoint. So within any kind of project management structure, you're limited by certain things. You know, you've got a budget, you've got a scope, you've got a schedule. And so if you outline it and take it from a very left brain standpoint, let's kind of objectively map this, this out. There are uh, moments in which the, through the evolution of that project that you want to create recognition in order to have the motivation for continuance. And I think that's uh, true of us as well in behavioral change is as much as we can tie in those rewards and, and uh, gifts, if you will, to keep uh, that motivation for continuing that process, I think is very beneficial, very impactful. And like I said before, if, if, they, if it's not a very appealing um, vision of the future, then why go in that direction? You know, it's much easier to stay in my comfort zone. And typically, I think most people shy away from changes because of the amount of energy it truly takes to be more conscious than unconscious in our behaviors. So what are we doing to support that um, additional energy uh, that is required of us? Uh, do we have recognition built in? Uh, do we have motivational, motivational moments? I'm a big fan of doing the huddle, you know, the five minute huddle with the group, you know, in the morning. Um, and I do that within myself every morning. You know, you're like, OK, what am I going to do? How am I going to feel this morning? Um, how do I set my goals and all those kinds of things? And what's going to happen if I start getting tired around two o'clock? You know, do I take that nap or maybe I don't take that nap? You know, maybe that's my gift, my motivation. I get to take that nap. You know, <laughs> so, I love I, that. I take the nap regardless of ever, you know, it just happens. <laughs> Good man, Kurt. I'm a big fan of the nap. Yeah. No, I think, I think that that's fantastic. You're, uh, even though you don't have a, a team of people that you're, you, you, you might do it with, you're, even just with yourself, you're just doing this individual huddle. I think that that's really cool. I, I wanted to, to turn over to um, a question about the psychological contract mm -hmm. that that employers have with employees. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I think that we can, we can safely assume that it's changing. Yeah. But can you talk about how you see it changing? So let me just frame it with um, saying that the psychological contract and what it is between employers and employees um, is this expectation from an employer standpoint, um, I'm going to give you a fair salary and you're going to continue to show up to work and do a, a decent uh, job uh, while you're here. And so the employee has that expectation that as long as I continue to show up on time and do a decent job, I will have a job. Um, and so that psychological contract, um, as it's articulated there, really started to break down, um, I would say, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so it was very much a part of the senior uh, and veteran ethos to reach back and mentor and apprentice the baby boomer population. 
but right around uh, the time when the baby boomers uh, started to see the entrance of the generation Xers into the workforce also coincided during a time which we had a downturn in the economy. And so we started to have a great deal of self-protectionism. Uh, knowledge is power. I'm going to hold it close to my vest. And so they didn't give it back to um, the, the Gen Xers in that case. And so they weren't pulled along and therefore they weren't provided the informal uh, development of leadership. Uh, and this also coincided during a time in which training's a luxury we can no longer afford. So all the budgets started drying up for training. So now we consequently have uh, Generation X, Millennials, and now entering our Gen Zs who receive little to no formal or informal leadership development whatsoever. So I think that from a leadership standpoint um, is a real crisis that we're facing. But the psychological contract diminished as a result of the breakdown in loyalty on both sides between the employer and the employee. And I think this was largely predicated by the downturn in the economy that the boomers experienced. Um, so as a result of that, you've got the Gen Xers who saw mom and dad, as I mentioned before, being downsized, right sized and all kinds of size. So they became much more jaded. And we're, we're seeing uh, as a result of that, what used to hover um, at, at right around 30 percent of the total workforce are gig workers or contractors. We're seeing an explosion of that percentage up into the 40% um, category. And I think that's only going to grow and potentially get up to about 50% or half of our total workforce are going to operate from this gig economy or contractual basis. So it's that um, breakdown of the psychological contract um, has continued to diminish uh, to a great extent. The, the full-time employer-employee relationship is really starting to dissolve. Um, and I think that that's that there has connotations on both sides for employer and job seekers as a result of that. Kurt, yeah. you were going to say something? Yeah, no, I d just a couple things. So uh, really interesting to think about this this contract as being I will pay you a salary and and then as, as an employer, I will pay you a salary. And then as an employee, I will do a decent job. And, and it, it's interesting to think that that seems pretty minimal. Right to to a certain degree, it it isn't talking about I'm gonna I'm gonna go over and above. I'm going to bring my best to this work, and you're going to reward me for doing things above and beyond. And so there's there's an interesting component of that. But then as you get into this this other concept, the second part of this that that I found interesting is you know moving to the the contract or moving to this gig economy, and so that relationship that psychological contract now is no longer for long term it is transactional to a certain degree yeah. in, in my understanding so could you address you know is there a part of that psychological contract with some organizations where it goes beyond decent and it is some higher aspirational pieces of this and and then we can come back to the the transactional part of, of a gig economy and what that might imply moving forward what a great question. And I think it's the uh, most cutting edge organizations <clears throat> that realize that people make decisions based on their career beyond just compensation. And to the extent that we can tie into the intrinsic values, not as much the extrinsic values that we have, um, you're going to have exactly what you're talking about, Kurt. Um, that idea of here's a place where you can explore your passions. Here's a place where you can really make a difference. Here's a place where you can create a legacy. Uh, and I think that's very attractive. We have <clears throat> within Gen X and millennials and Gen Z, these younger generations, um, they are the most um, optimistic um, generations and they have access to more information than prior generations ever had. So they're more socially aware as a result of that. Um, and we have seen within the last 10, 15 years, a, a outcropping of that, whereby we've created entire roles and positions within organizations to be dedicated to social responsibility. Yeah. Um, and so having that larger context of, you know, are we doing things that are not only good for our bottom line, but how does this benefit the community in which we work? How does this benefit society? Yeah, we 
we talked with Eli Finkel uh, on a whole different subject, which is on on relationships, right? And the way that uh, he's done some really interesting work on marriage and and relationships and how marriage has changed over the course of hundreds of years and mm-hmm. and, and very different things. And he said that we're moving into the stage where it's no longer just about you know this love, you have to actually help fulfill the other person in in who they are. And it sounds to me um, that there's a correlation here to what you're saying with these, uh, with the way that the world is moving and maybe some way that these top performers, you, you mentioned passion, right? If, if you can tap into that passion. And so that that psychological contract with an employer now goes beyond just that monetary piece. And it gets into the expectations could be changing so that it's getting into this idea that I'm not just working here for a paycheck. I need to work here to to grow, to develop who I am as a person, to, as you said, you know, giving back to the community. And, and that changes drastically, I think, how people um, show up at work, but also how companies need to recruit and how they need to put their programs in place and how they actually interact with their employees on a daily basis. Let's re- just refer to Zappos, a company who is known for their culture. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, they're a phone bank. Um, that's what they do is answer phones all day long. And that's not a really exciting environment, but they have people lined at, um, up around the corner to be able to have the opportunity to work for this organization because of their brand reputation of culture. This is a place where you can really be you and we, you know, uphold that and applaud that your eccentricities, bring them with you. You know, we want that. We want that creativity. And they know that that's what it comes down to is does our company reflect the people that we serve? And we know that the people we serve are highly diverse. So we need to have our internal organization represent that diversity as well. And so that includes embracing the different, embracing the strange, if you will. Uh, And that's okay. Um, Whereas you contrast that with a highly conservative organization where everyone wears the blue tie and blue suit and white shirt, you know, it's very different from one place to the next. So I think it calls upon us as individuals to really identify who we are and what we align with in terms of making those career choices. But as employers, what kind of environment do we want to have? Is that predicated on who we serve? Uh, does that is that predicated on our overall purpose as an organization? And then how do we articulate that in terms of a brand for attracting the kind of talent that we want to have here at this organization? So, so from an HR standpoint, you start to see some very creative job postings uh, as a result of that. And I can appreciate that, um, you know, getting away from the stodgy, you know, these are the minimum qualifications. This is what we're looking for. These are the benefits that you get <clears throat> where they go, go ahead um, to the next level and really define. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we do for, with our employees. This is our last annual outing where we all, you know, traveled to uh, this campground and had this special event. And it was all about getting to know each other and, you know, these are the silly, goofy things that we did, um, you know, that really created that con- connectivity. I think people were longing, I mean, literally longing for that kind of deeper connection in their work on, on a regular basis. And I, I think that's just an exciting, exciting, vibrant place to be. To what degree does it matter? Does the culture matter when 30, 40 plus percent are just gig workers when they're only doing it part time? Um, because I think they're going to have a choice um, and we all have choices and the more talented we are, the more choices we have. Um, and so here come the implications of that gig economy. The implications are as an employer, how are you still attracting the best and brightest talent to your projects? And to just say, hey, you know, you're going to work with us for this short period of time. It's highly transactional. Yes, we'll pay you fairly, um, but you're going to do the work and you're going to move on. I think um, as a result of the fact that that doesn't meet the intentions of most people today, that we have lack of coherence. And so until we have that greater coherence between what the employer is offering and what the job seeker is looking for, um, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of those people that are going to be leading edge um, that will attract the kind of uh, cutting edge talent that they're looking for for their own uh, workforce. Yeah, even if they're just doing it part-time. Even if they're just doing it as part-time. 
Yeah. Uh, again, you know, do I want to do my um, allocate my time, energy and talent to you part time uh, and you're only going to be highly transactional? Or do I want to do that over here where people appreciate me? People like me. I have like minded uh, colleagues to talk with and connect with. Um, and I get a lot of energy as a result of that. It sounds almost as if the in the gig economy, it may be more important for organizations to be focused in on this because of that opportunity for choice and the opportunity as a gig employee that I have, I can go to the next you know company uh, at a drop of a hat. And not that you can't do that as an employee, but it seems less part of that mindset of of an of what an employee has. An employee is, I'm, I'm here for a while at least, and I will stick with this regardless of what's going on until the pain, as we talked about earlier, gets so bad that I need to change. With a gig person, it's like, hey, this is one month. Next month, I don't like this so much, so I need to move on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my talents elsewhere to a place that appreciates me and, and offers these other things that you were just talking about. So to a certain degree, culture may be more important in a gig uh, economy than it would be in a traditional employee employer type approach. I agree. You don't have the tenets of this long term relationship implied um, with the full time employment and the benefit structures. Typically, in a contracting relationship, you don't receive those kind of benefits, uh, healthcare benefits at least. And so there's not that hook to keep you engaged, um, if you will, or keep you bought in. Um, and what's fascinating is I, I really see what I do is working from both ends of the workforce spectrum. So I work with the C-suite folks in terms of HR consulting, business consulting, leadership development, their systems, their processes, their people. But I also support the other end of the spectrum by supporting people in career transition with career branding. So I do a lot of the resume writing, the interview skills development, uh, the networking strategies. Uh, the LinkedIn profiles, things of that nature. And so one kind of feeds the other. When I'm working with those executives, I'm hearing their greatest concerns about talent. And I'm able to use that information to leverage my talent transition folks to better position them for opportunities and vice versa. And I can hear from my talent that, hey, this is what I'm really looking for from my employers. And so that information feeds um, the, the C-suite and I can impart to them that information. So it's really synergistic and complementary uh, in terms of the information. And I'm just kind of the liaison back and forth going, OK, you know, here's what I'm hearing over here. Here's what I'm hearing over here. So let's let's use this information to our advantage to the extent that we can. And to your point, Kurt, I think that's exactly what's incumbent upon these um, polarities is to understand how they're continuously branding themselves. How are they articulating what value they bring to the table? Uh, so let's turn over to what's happening right now. We're in the we don't know where we are in the pandemic, but it's still it's still happening. <laughs> we don't know how far out it's going to go. Yeah. We might still just be in the first 10 percent. Who knows? But let's hope not. But uh, work, the, the nature of work has changed and, and the way that we work with each other has changed. Um, can you, can you share some observations about the kind of things that you're seeing when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the, the worker, the employee, uh, employer relationship in pandemic times? I can, and I, you know, I'll take it, um, from a standpoint of, um, psychology and, and trauma. Um, I see that what's going on right now is, has the same psychological trauma effect as World War II, as the Vietnam era um, and war, um, as 9-11, as the Challenger explosion. So let's, let's kind of step back and look at that. So the veterans and seniors, um, the most significant um, external event that took place that shaped the characteristics and value set of that particular generation was World War II and the Depression. Now we're faced with uh, the baby boomer generation. They come along and they have Vietnam. And so all, all the, um, the extraneous issues related to uh, Vietnam, that really shaped that particular generation. My generation, Generation X, we were all sitting in a sixth grade, sixth grade classroom when they rolled in the TV just to show an entire generation of kids the Challenger explosion blowing up, another trauma-induced event. 
Now we have 9-11 that took place for uh, the millennial generation. So here we are sitting in the middle of a pandemic um, whereby we're constantly being told that people are dying left, right, and center, that the cases are elevating, that this is a global issue. Um, and we're seeing that our entire economy has basically been shut down. So if you don't think that that has some psychological and stress-inducing uh, impacts, uh, check your pulse. Um, and I think that we'd be we'd be remiss as employers and leaders of organizations to say to act like everything's just fine. Uh, everything's fine. You know, the wind stopped blowing. We're, we're great. You know, um, gee, ma, it's all good around here. Um, and then continue to say, OK, we need those productivity numbers. We need to work harder. We need to double down. This is where I think we need to step up as leaders and be much more empathetic and have a greater level of emotional intelligence. And that emotional intelligence understands that our emotions significantly impact our behavior. And so if, once again, if we're operating from that fear and stress paradigm, which most of us probably are if we're paying attention to anything that's going on around us, and then you couple that with the fear and stress associated with um, work dynamics, that compounds it to such an extent that it almost paralyzes one um, to stay stuck in, in where they are and to only operate from this protectionism mindset. Um, think about creativity and ingenuity. You cannot, let me put it this way. If you were being chased by a grizzly bear, um, you wouldn't be able to solve too many math problems because your prefrontal cortex wouldn't be operating in that capacity. OK, and so I often talk about this. You guys know this very well. When you're in the fight or flight mode, um, biochemically speaking, the brain literally shunts blood um, from the prefrontal cortex where all that higher processing takes place down into the most reptilian aspect of the brain and uh, enables you to fight, flight or freeze. And so it's ironic to me, highly ironic to me that we have these environments that are run by management, by intimidation and scare tactics, because it only produces minimal compliance and minimal compliance to the extent where I'm only going to do enough just to get by without getting in trouble and still collect a paycheck. When right now, what we need more than anything else are, is problem solvers. We need ingenuity. We need that creativity. We need that collaboration. But it seems like our external world is pus pushing us in the uh, opposite direction. So I think it calls upon the great leaders to be, really stand above and beyond their, uh, their colleagues and, and uh, counterparts when they can identify that and consciously lead their workforce through that process to realize what it's all about and create that alignment to the organizational purpose. So that's comes in. I Go think ahead. it's really interesting, this idea of the amount of stress that we're under. And there's been research by uh, the center, uh, or actually the, the Census Bureau has been doing a pulse survey since I believe June or May sometime. And, and they're, they're, they're looking at various different things. And they found that uh, one third of the people that they're surveying, extrapolating that out to the general population, are experiencing um, symptoms of psychological distress and depression and a number of other things. And the, the thing is, is that within work, at least this is, you know, the, the clients that, that I've been working with, and I know Tim has, has experienced the same thing, is that when we show up at work, the vast majority of folks put on this face. They, they put on a, uh, you know, I, I cannot show that I'm hurting and that I'm in this world that is falling around or falling down around me. And so they don't necessarily show that or at least express it. It may come out in, in ways that aren't necessarily expected, but oftentimes what we see is, is leaders are going, well, I, I'm not seeing this. You know, people are showing up, they're, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And yet you kind of go, yeah, but one out of every three of those people is could be or possibly could be, you know, having some of these uh, effects of, of everything that is going on because of the pandemic that's going on. And so I think it's really hard for business leaders to to often 
understand the impact that that's having on their company and on their employees. It's it's this idea that, you know, what's invisible doesn't get noticed. And, and from our brain perspective, we can then tend to ignore it. And that's not really the case at all. It is that it's still there, even if we're not seeing it um, expressed in the Zoom calls that we're all making right now. Well, Kurt, I, th- I think we also recognize, too, that management is typically hesitant to do anything different unless it's a flaming bag of something <laughs> on their doorstep. <laughs> right? So it, unless it's critically emergent, you know, and it's a crisis situation, management's not going to do much different. So I, I kind of um, also questioned the veracity of interest and delving into those kinds of things either. <laughs> this is painful stuff. And do I even have the capabilities of asking these kind of questions or leading my uh, employees through this? And so now we're asking our leaders to be, um, you know, counselors in some in some respect. And that's true. They need to be, well, uh, the most conscious leaders out there are highly introspective and they have an understanding of themselves, but also that reflects an understanding of other people and the challenges that they go through. And that there goes the empathy as well. Um, so I think that um, while leaders can easily say, I'm not seeing those things, to what extent are they really drilling down to find out those things? And then once they do see those things, to what extent are they able to lead their uh, workforce through Um, you know, growth and coming out of that self-protectionism mode to really operating from integrity, creativity, ingenuity, problem solving. Yeah, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier, which you said um, people shy away from change because of the energy required. And I think in this instance, exploring that is requires a lot of energy, um, not just physical energy, but psychological energy to, to try to dig into the you know, how my people are doing, how are they actually feeling and not just what they're expressing uh, at, at that face value. And so I think that's a big piece of this. Yeah. And I think this is a golden opportunity for us to say, let's choose our energy because we're going to exert it no matter what. Now, do you want to experience it as a result of stress or do you want to experience it as a result of excitement for what could be? Um, You know, and you talk about uh, stress. I think it's one of the most debilitating um, things that exists and creates most dis-ease that is out there today. Um, You know, people don't have heart attacks just because of their eating habits. Typically, it's because of their stress, which causes eating habits, which causes, you know, exacerbates these things. So underlying most disease is this stress. But our work environments, you know, most people refer to their work as stressful. Our external uh, demands, you know, I need to put food on the table and need to make sure the mortgage is there. By the way, do I have a long term plan for retirement? Um, You know, and all these external factors that are just moving in and in and in on us. And we feel that level of stress. Uh, And unless we're consciously addressing those things, those unconscious feelings of stress continue to accumulate within us. And to the extent that a leader can say, all right, let's set that aside for a moment. Let's put that down and let's uh, stand back and say, well, how do we want to move from here? Uh, Let's break this down and be much more conscious as to what the bigger picture is. So here's the question, the most important question of the whole day. I just want to let you know. I'm just going to set it. (laughs) <laughs> is that time already? Oh, it is that time already, Tim? Really? <laughs> You've got uh, Kurt down over here. You get Kurt stress, Tim. Stop it. <laughs> uh, what's on your pandemic playlist? Oh wow, fantastic! What a good question. <laughs> See, how about that, Kurt? How about that? It's a fantastic question. You know, I am, <laughs> so the reason I appreciate it is because I. I respect and understand the extent to which music can energetically shift us. Um, so I like any kind of music that will take me out of myself. Um, so I'm listening to things, um, and I, I go old school typically, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, jazz, uh, old school jazz, Grateful Dead. Uh, so I love the jam band kind of music. Uh, but that said, Radiohead uh, is one of my most favorite bands, and you can pick up any one of their albums and really get a different experience as a result of that. Um, 
that said, I'm a I'm a uh, Gen Xer, so the the '90s, the Nirvanas um, out there, the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, these are highly emotive uh, kind of bands, and when you're just stressed and frustrated and want to get that out, it's good stuff. Just jamming that, and I. It's funny you say that because I've found myself. Um, you know, uh, hopping in the car and just turning up the music as loud as I can and driving. Wow. Wow. As a stress response. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, see, in that, I, the, I, Tim, we've had this conversation, <laughs> right? You play that angry, loud music as a stress response. It, it helps. Absolutely. You know? yeah. There's something about that bass beat bumping and, and, you know, hitting your heart. It's good stuff. Yeah. So I, I have to ask on Radiohead, right? Um, so, OK Computer was kind of their big, it wasn't their big breakout. Their breakout was the Benz, right? Um, uh, but very different sound. And, 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 and OK Computer kind of pushed them to more experimental type of music and various different pieces there. Do you have a favorite from those, those two? Um, you know, is it more of the, because the Benz is more of your Nirvana-ish type right. music. I, I really, um, when Hail to the Thief came out, mm. That was what I really identified with because it had a bit of the uh, the grungy kind of um, you know stuff in it, but it also had a kind of um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, n- not metaphysical, but uh, you know, kind of uh, trippy hippie kind of stuff um, sounds in it. Yeah, Tom, you know? Tom York was kind of going into you know uh, he's obviously the genius in, in all this stuff, but he, he kind of Indeed. brought some of that in, into, in, into this whole piece of, of course. Well, I know that Tom was quite into the club scene and uh, he, he, I'm sure he's participated in a couple pharmaceutical <laughs> injections. Um, so, <laughs> I think that certainly had an influence somewhere. Could have very well. Yeah. As, as, as evidenced by the on and off, you know, I'm, you know, yeah. times during their, their, their career not being this, perfect arc yeah um that's pretty that's pretty fantastic do you also listen to music while you work um so what i put on while i work is um 432 hertz music um so i'll select all different kinds of um like bach for concentration um but i i like to listen to um 432 hertz music so as music fans i'm sure you guys realize that most music is tuned to 440 but mm-hmm. we know that the natural ris- rhythm based on the Schumann resonance is 432. Why that was changed many, many years ago, I have my theories. Um, but uh, to that extent where I can feel totally relaxed and focused and concentrate, that's the kind of music I'll put on in the background. I do a great deal of writing, so I need more instrumental music rather than uh, lyrics to hear in the background. Yeah. yeah. I want to hear your theory. Why, why do you think, uh, uh, and we don't have to get deep into this, but, but 440 is, is standard and that is how all uh, pianos are, are tuned and how all instruments are tuned today. But why do you think uh, there was a change from 432 to 440? I think esoterically speaking, people um, recognized and understood the impact of energy on us. And um, to the extent that there is a desire for control of people, Um, anything that would uh, limit people's personal control and expand the control of uh, leaders that wish to control the population. Uh, This was a part of the impetus. And so I think that 440 was created for dissonance purposes, not to create coherence. So both of you guys are well over my head of comprehension here, but I'm going to leave it to Tim to explain it to me after the show's done. (laughs) I just Okay, so that that is interesting. This idea of control, I I, I think that the and and energy, it it absolutely peps us up a bit. Um, there, but there were, of course, you know, uh, Eastern music didn't do that, you know, um, or you know, the Asian, you know, uh, m- uh, multitonal yeah. uh, music uh, with uh, Indian and uh, Chinese, Japanese traditional music, they didn't adopt that that model they they actually kind of stayed in their idea that we're going to we're going to we're going to move away from uh, a 12 tone system and and stick with a 22 tone system or something that's a little more nuanced so, so um, ryan when we, when you say you listen to 432 hertz music is that just like a is that like a spotify channel uh, how do you or, or do you actually go and search for this 
I'll just go on YouTube typically yeah. and put in 432 Hertz music and up will come a plethora of different choices and I'll scan through them and all oh, this looks good today. Okay. Um, a lot of what you might um, see from a standpoint of 432 Hertz music will be uh, meditation related. Um, but there's a lot of folks out there that have reconditioned their music to cohere to the 432 Hertz. Cool. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah. And, you know, fantastic. if you want to stand back and, and talk about the control dynamic um, a little bit, you know, look at our structures of our workforce. Predominantly, we see an authoritarian model. And that authoritarian model is either you do this or you're going to receive some kind of repercussion as a result of not doing that. And. I think those models have existed for thousands of years. And I think we're calling, we are evolving as a society to the extent that which I don't think authoritarianism, authoritarianism serves us as well. Back when we were making widgets, we were back in the industrialized era. It was all about scientific management, what efficient motions you created in order to produce the most efficient product in the end. Frederick Taylor, all that stuff. You got yeah. it. You got it. So from the standpoint of we're an information-based society, how our consciousness interacts with this information must be freed up and not shut down. And so I often, you know, I was talking about this the other day. I, I work with someone who I remember very clearly saying, Ryan, just tell me what you want done and I'll do it. And I th because this was her response to me asking her a lot of questions about what she thought and what she wanted to do. And she was like, why are you asking me all these questions? I I'm just used to people telling me what they want me to do and I just do it. And I'm saying, well, that's no longer good enough. You know, I want your mind. I want your heart. I want your creativity. I want your experience. And if you're only doing what I tell you to do, I'm getting a fraction of that. I'm not getting what I paid for. And so I think that this is a great, great opportunity for all of us to reconfigure how we view leadership and how we organize our companies and our organizations. What kind of hierarchy and structure um, system is in place? And I think that, that the best and brightest are out there and recognizing this. And we're starting to see flatter and flatter organizations because they're much more nimble to respond to market demands rather than the large bohemists who can't get out of their own way. No. That's fantastic. Ryan, thank you so much for your time and your perspectives and your insights. This has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. I would love to do this on a regular basis. You guys are a lot of fun. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our conversation with Ryan, have a free flowing discussion and talk about whatever else comes into our psychologically contracted brains. Ooh, wow. Like that, uh, you, you were digging on that, uh, that contract stuff, the employee employer contract, huh? Yeah, we have that psychological contract. It's not the signed contract. It's this psychological contract that we have. And it's kind of important. It, kind of, right? It is kind of important, right? It exists whether or not you think about it, right? You don't have to do anything about it. It just exists. It's I didn't sign that damn contract, but yet it's still in existence. That's right. That's and what, what the hell is up with that? Huh? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, you want to start there? You, you, you want to? Sure. Let's start at, at psychological contracts and the employee employer contract. Cause I think, so we talked about this a lot with, with, with Ryan, right? And so this was a big part of the the overall conversation. And I know we kind of put it when we were going back over everything, we kind of put it in three parts, right? There's this, you know, the the gig economy and, and how that's changing this and just some interesting pieces that he brought up is that, you know what? The gig economy, you, you still have this psychological contract, even with gig workers. Right. I love this. I also just shout outs to him for breaking it down and, and thinking about these things from a generational perspective. I, I just, just as a, as a quick side note, just want to say that, but the, the whole discussion about the gig economy really opened my eyes to the idea that employers need to bear more responsibility in making their places of employment desirable 
for gig economy workers, because if they're going to attract the best and the brightest, they're going to have to have a cool place to work. It's going to have to be more than just, yeah, you know, you're coming for a paycheck, you know? Right. I mean, the, the, the paycheck is the minimal, right? That, that's the, that's the, the low bar that you have to, to cross. Yep. Yeah. But then you have, and I think this was an interesting piece, right? With gig workers, you're, it's easier to kind of shift, right? I, I have had many conversations with, with, Lyft and Uber drivers, right? Back in the day when I used to travel and would take Lyfts and Ubers to the airport or various different things when I was in in a city. Um, and, you know, a lot of those conversations I'd be asking, well, they, they work for both. They, they are, they have a Uber app and they have a Lyft app and Might they're have looking at a regular day gig too. And many of them have a regular day gig, but the fact of the matter is, is sometimes they're going, oh well, this is because I'm I'm I get more money here and various different pieces. But then when you actually talk to them, they're going, well, which one do you go with first? Well, I go with this one because this is the one that I like because of these features or these factors. And sometimes that had to do with with how much they earn, but oftentimes it was just ease of work or, you know, the other things that they're doing for you and a variety of other factors. And so I think that's a really key piece in yeah. this whole conversation. We have talked to companies, um, to employees of companies recently and uh, about the relationship between their pay and their loyalty to the company. And we have found many, many people saying, I'm loyal to my company, even though I know that from a competitive perspective, I'm being paid 20, 30, 40 percent less than market, uh, yeah, uh, right for this job. Than what I could get if I went out and put my, you know, hat in the ring tomorrow, I could get a job that would pay significantly more, life changing amount more, not just a couple thousand dollars here or there. This is this is twenty, forty thousand dollar difference in some of these people's paychecks, and. What was interesting is they talked about the culture. They talked about the the ideas and the leadership and the way that they were treated and all of those factors that came into place as part of the reason why they were not putting their hat in the ring. Yeah. Part of the reason why they they were there. So there's a monetary value to organizations who build up a good culture and not saying that if you have a good culture, you can then pay your, your people less. That's not what I'm saying. Um, you know, but the idea that the good culture attracts these really good working people and the loyalty that you get from them is that much more, I think is really significant. Yeah. There is that risk of uh, bending the ethical uh, side of the curve and saying, Okay, we're going to pay people less and and spend a, a little, you know, spend save a lot on salary and spend a little bit on culture, and then basically trick people into into staying, create higher job satisfaction, but but reducing payroll. And and we think that that's ethically that's a bad idea. You gotta you gotta take money off the table by being competitive in in your pay, uh, right? That that's 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 core to our our belief system. Right, and and to that degree, it doesn't mean that you need to be the highest paying company. Okay. Nope. So that's part of this, right? You can attract the best of the best by paying competitively, but not having to be at the top. If you can create a culture and a work environment that satisfies some of the needs and wants and desires of your employees and building on that psychological contract, we are going beyond what you just do for your pay. You're doing this because you feel an affinity towards the organization. You align with their overall ethics and what they're trying to do in the world. You appreciate the, the recognition and the work that you get to do and the challenges that your company is giving to you and the people that you work with, as well as your manager and, you know, the, the type of work that you get to do, all of those come into play. Well, and Ryan teed it up, not just as a retention strategy, but as an acquisition strategy for talent, like how to acquire, not just, not just retain, uh, but gain the really, the, the best and the brightest 
you know, uh, and I thought that that was a fantastic way of thinking about this. It, it, it was, it really changed my thinking about the gig economy. Now, my challenge is that I don't see a lot of companies doing that yet. I see a lot of companies still saying, hey, the great news about these these contract workers is that I don't have to pay healthcare benefits on them. So they yeah. spend a lot of money and I can still hire them for long periods of time as long as they're consultants and they meet certain uh, legal guidelines, then I don't have to have to worry about paying health care and uh, employment taxes on them, for instance. But I do think that we're going to have to head in this direction because, as Ryan pointed out, if 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 we get to a gig economy that's 40, 50 percent of the workforce, people still are going to need health insurance. They're going to need a way to save for the future. They're going to need 401ks and things like that. So uh, employers are going to have to figure that out. And I think that we're on the right path. Yeah, I think it's it's getting there. Let's go talk about something else that that Ryan was talking about, which was this idea of change, right? Um, behavior change, and and where change comes from, and and I know there was this this part that you really liked, right? That was this, you know, uh, and I'm quoting here uh, that Ryan said, while most people think of change as something new coming in change is typically tipped off by a loss of something. Yeah. That's a pretty, you know, interesting way of, of framing how, yeah. how people change. It, it is. It, what really caught me about that, not, not just because it kind of connects to loss aversion, but the fact that, uh, that business leaders are, tend to think about, I'm going to change to create something new. But the fact is they're probably changing because the pain of staying the same is is too high, right? And and they're losing something. Something is 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 diminished in their world, and so now they're pushed to change. Even though the framing they have in their mind is, oh, let's let's go and do something different. Um, you know, I, I come from a world where I, I was fortunate to be on a leadership team that asked the question, okay, if it's not broken, how can we how can we break it and and do it better? That. <laughs> And that's a really valuable thing for leaders to to do is to actually get on the other side of this idea, not think about well, all I, all I've got is this loss, so now we've got to make it up. You know, there's a there's a lot of pain in going through what we're going through right now, so we got to change it. How about how about let's look at the things that are that are working pretty well and improve them. Right. Well, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? So you 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 think about that, right? When do companies really more. When do they pivot? It's it's when they need to, when there is something that is going astray. You know, we we would love to get out in front of things and and anticipate, oh, the market is going here or this is where we see the future going and so we need to change in order to adapt for that. That's hard. That is very difficult yeah. for companies to do, particularly companies that are a little bit larger, that have status quo bias that comes into play, a variety of different things. But if you are in a situation where your market is tanking, sales are going down, uh, you're, you're running into these types of issues with whatever customer satisfaction, whatever it is, then you have to put, the, then that change happens because you're solving for this issue that is immediate and, you know, it's temporal. It's right there in front of you, as opposed to this is the way the world is going. Because that's always a that's always a bet, and and it's hard for people, I think, to to get around a bet when you're not sure how that bet is going to play out. This is a sure damn thing, right? We're we're losing, and so now we can take a bet. It doesn't matter because the as Annie Annie Duke says, it's almost a free roll, right? If you don't do anything, it's going to to sh to shit. So yeah. might as well try something new. Yeah. Uh, the other cool, not the other, because Ryan had a lot of cool ideas, but there was another one that really struck me. And I just, I just wanted to, to reflect on the idea that he said that leadership has the greatest influence over culture within an organization. And so to that point, the extent to which the leader is conscious or unconscious in terms of their own behavior and actions ripples and affects the entire culture of the organization. I thought, man, I mean, there's, all kinds of styles, right? There's task, there's collaboration, there's balance, there's all kinds of ways that you can break down leadership. But maybe the pivot or, or the, the fulcrum that this whole thing rests on is awareness, it, <sighs> is, is that consciousness or unconsciousness that they have of their own actions. 
that might be the 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 point on which all of this rests. I, mean, I thought that was a fantastic observation that you had. Well, you kind of you you look at this from the perspective of everything that a leader does impacts what the organization does, thinks, feels. So it it plays into that culture. And you can either do that consciously and purposefully, or you can just let it happen happenstance. Now, sometimes happenstance is perfect. It works out great. It's it, you, you are doing the right things just by chance, yeah. um, or it's your, in your nature or, or however that would be. But wouldn't it be better in many instances if we were purposeful about this and we thought through what is this going to do? How is this going to impact people, how people see us, how others respond to us, and what this means for the company overall? And, and if the leaders are doing that, those exercises, with a dose of self-awareness, there's a greater chance of success, I think. So what is a dose of self-awareness, Tim? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's more than a dram, but not as much as a pound. <laughs> Which is the hard part. Uh, this is the part I think that is the challenge. I think most people would agree with what we said before, right? Uh, let's be purposeful about this, right? This idea, but we don't fully know our own selves. This this comes down to a lot of the, the stuff we've talked about on the show all the time. We have blind spots. We have huge, huge blind spots about our own actions, behaviors, and how that impacts others. We have our huge, huge blind spots on our own motivations. We think this will motivate us, and yet we know it doesn't. And so we have to overcome those blind spots to have that self-awareness. And that's not easy. No. That is a hard thing to you do. Could, you, uh, leaders could engage in uh, thinking like through hypothetical scenario planning. Right, they they could actually do sort of a, what might happen and think through that uh, in a very intentional way. Uh, they could uh, th they could do a pre mortem. Mm -hmm. They could they could actually get into what might happen, what might go bad if we do this, and right. What 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 are the negative consequences of doing this, and um, what led to those negative? You know, anticipate that it failed, and so what led to that failure so that we don't do this, right? Right. Which, yeah. which is about uh, another piece of this is anticipated regret. You know, what is the, what, what would I regret if we didn't, or if we did this and it went wrong, or if we didn't do this and, and thinking through again, using these behavioral science methodologies mm -hmm. of trying to get ourselves to think about our future selves in a more concrete manner that really plays into how that's going to drive the change that we need, the emotional um, fuel to make that change happen today. That's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. it, it uh, Ryan talked about how you could look at this from a very practical way, like as a project manager, you know, and, and I love this sort of taking the emotion out of it. Like, okay, we've got a scope and a schedule and, and a budget. Um, there's going to be rewards and recognition, but maybe you could even go so far as to say, couldn't, can we create a random control test? Can we have us a pilot of something and test something out, right? Let's actually see how something might actually affect our people in our culture in these circumstances. Um, and you've got to get past motivated reasoning and you have to be, leaders have to be self-aware enough to loop back in order to get over themselves in order to say, let's go with the data. Let's actually try something and see what happens. Uh, and again, when we think about this, all of this sounds great. <laughs> it, it comes into it comes into implementation of this, which gets to be hard because we are emotional creatures. We are yep. people who you you have hot and cold states, and in these cold states that we're talking about now, everything. Yes, we should definitely do this. We should go forth and put these plans in place and be self aware and all of these factors. And yet, when day to day comes back, it's the you know same old operating way that we did it before because that's what we fall back into those habits and routines i think this is where a lot of the work that we think about from incentives rewards can have an impact because you can 
drive more of that mind share and thinking through how do you actually motivate people in in these change, particularly from a leadership perspective, to drive those self-aware kind of behaviors. And so how can you, what are the things that you can do from uh, an incentive perspective to get us to think about wh- how to do this self-awareness and to check those things and to run pre-mortems and different pieces? And there are ways to do that. And you can just put those in place. Yeah, yeah. there are, every issue that you've got that is related to a person, that is related to people, there can be a behavioral solution to that. And we have to be willing to look at uh, and understand what the what is motivating those behaviors, what's driving those behaviors, what's the context of those behaviors, in order to understand what kind of potential solutions might be viable, and then to test them to find out what is the most viable or, yeah. or, or the most apropos. And for you know, we we do love our intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, and and we know that that sometimes, especially in a big change initiative, you might need to put a little sugar on the cereal, you know, Mm -hmm. because it might be good to have some extrinsic to get the ball rolling so that people in the organization feel like, okay, I know how to do this. I'm going to take this thing that was unfamiliar and you're going to reward me for doing it. All right, I'll do it for the rewards, but, but I might build up a habit. I might actually find some, something virtuous that is intrinsically rewarding once I start doing it. All right, BF Skinner, way to go. There you go. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, I mean, it, thinking about this, there is there is that intrinsic component. And so we, we're not saying, at least I think we're not saying, I know I'm not saying that this is all just an extrinsic component that if you just put the right monetary or, you know, extrinsic incentives in place that you're going to change the way that people behave and different things. We have to take into consideration the intrinsic components, but it can't be an either or. It needs to be a both. And this is the big piece that I think uh, we were talking about drive the other day on a, on a podcast that we were guests on, right? And asking, is it underrated or overrated? And and I think the the one piece about drive that that makes it overrated is this idea that you know those extrinsic rewards can be be hurtful and and I don't think that's the case right I I, I think Dan Pink got it a little bit wrong when he 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 kind of focused in on some of DC and Ryan's you know research that that pointed to this without looking at the the whole body of work around it that being said. We also understand that intrinsic motivation is really key and has a much more impactful uh, behavior change opportunity in the long run, right? To to keep those extrinsic incentives in place is probably cost prohibitive if you really want to try to drive change. So you have to, at some point, switch over to the intrinsic. And to loop back to Ryan's commentary about uh, trying to acquire and attract the best and brightest, then you might have to, that the companies might have to be putting out information about what their last company outing was. You know, was it a, was it, we're all going to a big Star Wars uh, convention or is it, we're, we're all going hiking in the mere woods, you know, right. There's a cultural aspect to that, that you can say, oh, I more identify with the, I'd rather go hiking that, you know, that's a cool thing. Uh, But then this other company, you know, they like to go to Star Wars conventions and that's not my gig or, you know, or maybe it is, I don't know, but but let's put all that out there to identify, to allow people to connect their intrinsic motivation. And and the, 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 the piece that when you said this though, that just hit my mind is we have to be really careful about those as well, because we want to have diversity and we want to be able to get, uh, attract a diverse group of people. And so if you just go to Star Wars conventions that that very it limits the type of person that you're going to attract. So again, this comes back down to that unconscious factors that a leadership may be putting in place. Are, are you thinking about what you're doing as a corporate retreat? And is that where you want that to be, particularly if you're trying to create a workforce that brings different perspectives in and has different points of view that are going to provide benefit for not only you, but your customers and just make your your organization better overall. 
those are the things that we have to think about very consciously and think about that. Um, but you bring a really good point. So maybe each company could do a Star Wars convention and a hike through Mirror Woods. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just saying. Just, just saying, you know, you know, well, I, I, you know, yeah, it's, it's difficult. This is the piece it comes down to. It's difficult, which is why you need to be purposeful and why you need to bring these behavioral science insights into your work. And, you know, and if you need to, you can hire Tim or me and we can help you work through all this stuff, but yeah, <sighs> yes, that's it's a big challenge, right? It's a big challenge out there. All right, Tim. So you were going to ask me a musical question, but I'm going to ask you one instead. So oh, changing the script. All right. I know. I know. Um, so you were going to ask me if I had found uh, any new artist during 2020. And I, I haven't, it's been a, it's been a slow year for me. No, You're still no Flora cash. No, no Angus and Julia stone uh, coming out of the 2020 pandemic. But you have found some some new artists and and recording people. So who are they? Well, there's just a couple that I found that I keep coming back and listening to. And one da, one is Linda Diaz. Uh, she's got a tune called Green Tree Ice Cream that I'll link to in the show notes. And there's just a sweetness about it. Uh, no pun intended, because it's Green Tree Ice Green Tea Ice Cream. Uh, there's no pun intended there. But there's a during this particularly challenging time uh, in our world that I think it's nice to have something that's really kind of light and thoughtful, right? She's a, she's a good lyricist, but there's something kind of light and joyful about her voice. And I, and I think that that's really important. Well, if it has to do with ice cream, I mean, come on, exactly. I'm in, I'm in. I mean, you know, the, you know, I think about um, the songs like the sunny side of the street, you know, were that was written during the depression, you know, in a terrible time. But it was it was all about doing something happy. Uh, okay, that that's no matter. Uh, the other one is uh, Fabio uh, da Nascimento, and uh, Fabio uh, da Nascimento is a Brazilian guitarist who he plays a wide variety of guitar and guitar like instruments. He plays a, a nine string guitar and he plays a 12 string and he plays a six string. Yeah. Really interesting configurations. And it's mostly based on bossa nova, which is a very Brazilian based form, but he is fantastically soulful. And I just think that uh, sometimes you just need to kind of hunker down with something really warm. It's like, it, like listening to his stuff is like a, a cup of hot tea. It's really, it's really just warm and comforting. So, so as opposed to the light, fluffy ice cream, this is yeah. warm, comforting tea. All yeah. right. Yeah, it's All just, right. It's just, yeah. So, so you're still listening to Depeche Mode, huh? <laughs> <laughs> they just got, inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame oh man i somehow i missed that <laughs> you missed that come on and you know who else did who nine inch nails no way seriously yes there you go two of my favorites 2020 inductees so i, I got a question i gotta just really nine inch nails that's just okay depeche mode they belong in the rock and roll hall of fame. I just have a question about nine inch nails. That's Trent Reznor chain brought industrial music to the masses. He did, you know, you can, you can go back and you can look at the, the world of, uh, you know, ministry and, and uh, skinny puppy and, and others along that line. And they, they never made it big or they would not have made it big if it would not have been for, Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails. So he changed the entire landscape of, of that type of, of of that type of music. Just because you don't like it, don't don't diss it. No, so I, I I believe that Trent Reznor is a super talented guy. Totally on board with that. It's just the stuff that got created with Nine Inch Nails. I was just not so happy with. But that's my that's my deal. So okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, next time you're, when, when, when this is all over and we get back together, I'm going to be jamming some Nine Inch Nails next time you come in the studio. <laughs> Rivers, hang on for just a minute. We'll come back with a bonus track in just a moment.
Hey Groovers, this is Tim with your bonus track and groove idea for the week. In our conversation with Ryan, we were introduced to some great ways that practitioners are making hay with excellent applications of behavioral science. Kurt and I were impressed with Ryan's clear and clever thinking about things like loss and the way loss is a catalyst for change and how he was quick to render lists and processes to help solve problems. Clearly, the social contract between the employer and the employee has changed dramatically. We can all agree to that. But we were pleased to hear Ryan speak so optimistically about a future where employees need to put forth more effort and employers need to put forth more effort to attract and retain the best and brightest of the employees. It got us thinking, could the growing gig economy actually offer more value to the workers than the employers? Hmm. Something to think about. Lastly, we appreciated Ryan's approach to working through the pandemic and the reminder that intimidation and scare tactics have no place in today's workplace. Frederick Taylor's workplace, well, should just be a thing of the past, period. For your groove idea this week, we'd like to ask you to take a look at your own office. Size up the culture and ask yourself this, has it changed during the pandemic? And if it's changed, is it getting better? Is your company a better place to work today than it was last year? Let us know what you think. We always love hearing from you. And today we encourage you to take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out, and go out and find your groove. Groove.